Hi friends and happy new year. Yes, indeed it is not only the first Sunday, but the first day of 2023. And we're glad that you're spending it with us. As we get ready to worship, let me issue those regular reminders that I try to give each week. The first of those is that if we haven't connected and you're worshiping with us, we would love to know that you're there. So visit our website, icdisciples.org. And we'd love it if you would take a moment and click on the connection card, fill that out, and we'll be in touch. Also, as worship begins, this is a great time to gather the items you'll need. Uh, we will be lighting a candle here in a moment. So if you like to light a candle, gather one of those. And then also we will take communion toward the end of the service. And so have something to receive as bread and something as the cup ready for when we share communion together. So now we do light our candle. This candle is a reminder of Christ's presence with us. God with us, which we celebrate in this continuing Christmas season. And now let us join together in singing our opening hymn, God of our life. The words will be on your screen. Let's worship together. If you are watching this video when it goes live, it is January 1st, 2023, the very first day of a brand new year. Now I was thinking that something that people like to do at the beginning of the new year is they like to set uh, resolutions, which are goals, promises, commitments um, for the new year. Um, maybe it's something that somebody wants to accomplish, like read a certain number of books. Maybe it's something like um, starting um, an exercise routine. Maybe it's um, something like see my friends more often. There are lots of things that people set resolutions for. And so I was thinking about this idea of resolutions around the new year, and it had me kind of wondering, like, why do people really only make resolutions around the new year? Because we have lots of opportunities in our lives, in our days, in our weeks to set goals, to 
promise to make changes, um, to do something different, to try something new. We don't only have to do those around the new year. So I, I kind of want to just spend this message reminding you about that, that every day is a brand new day. It's an opportunity to start over, even if the day before was really crummy. And every moment is an opportunity to try again. Maybe you didn't get along very well with your sibling over winter break. Well, you have the opportunity to try again every day, every moment, even within a single day. So I hope that we will remember that, that as we go through this new year, that every moment is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to choose kindness. It's an opportunity for us to choose love. And um, that God loves us no matter what. And God is there in our corner cheering us on. Let's say a prayer together. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the gifts in our lives. God, help us to remember as we go into this new year that every moment is an opportunity to start new. Every day that we wake up, every moment that we turn around or breathe, that we can try again, that we can make choices to be kinder, to show more care for others. So God, we ask that you lay that on our hearts and that it may never be far from our minds, especially when things are kind of hard. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Today we are skipping ahead a bit in the story to see how Matthew ends the birth narrative. And this part of the story, a part we often choose not to read, comes with difficult and scary realities for Jesus and his parents. We are reading today from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Let us listen for a word from God. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. May God's blessing be added to our hearing of this word. Happy New Year, friends. Today, is January 1st. For those of us who follow the Gregorian calendar, which is most of the world, it is the start of something fresh. 
Today we begin the year 2023 in the Common Era. Meanwhile, on the church calendar, it is still the season of Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas are the time from the feast day of Christmas to Epiphany. So this is still the time in the church year when we are also celebrating that which is new. In this case, not a new year, but a new birth, the birth of Jesus. So, in the midst of these realities, why in the world did we hear this piece of scripture? Let's be honest. We would rather hear more stories of angelic announcements, a mother treasuring things in her heart, stories of kind visitors coming to see a baby, and Mary and Joseph's expanding understanding of what was happening. But instead today, we stepped a little further into the story and read a passage many of us would prefer to forget even exists. Because we love a cooing baby in a manger. We love cattle lowing and shepherds visiting, magi traveling from afar to bring gifts. But what do we do with a king who wants to kill the little children? What do we do with a baby who isn't warmly tucked in on a bed of hay, but instead is held in his mother's shivering arms as they make their way to another country out of fear for their very lives? What do we do with a holy family who doesn't look like the classical artwork we see, but looks much more like the poor families at our own southern border. And what does any of this have to do with this new year upon which we are about to embark? Well, what better time than now? As a new year begins, what better time than now to step away from our half-truths and partial stories and to commit to living in the complex realities of our lives and of our faith? What better time than now as we turn and start a new calendar, as we look ahead with anticipation to commit to being fully the people God asks us to be. And if we're going to do that, then that requires difficult honesty. So we start by trying to remember that the birth of Jesus and the story surrounding it was not an easy one. Sure, we acknowledge that in some ways when we talk about Luke's story, which has Mary nearly full term in her pregnancy, making a hard journey to Bethlehem. Yes, we acknowledge that when we see them having to stay in a place less comfortable than we would hope for our newborn Jesus. But those are really the palatable challenges of this story. See, Matthew's story asks us to swallow a more difficult pill of truth-telling. Matthew asks us to see beyond the inconvenience and discomfort and to come face to face with the life and death realities of Jesus' birth. As Eric Barreto, professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary wrote, from the very first, the road Jesus walks is marked by both God's promises and human resistance. Jesus is both the living presence of God's promises and a constant irritant to those in power. 
So perhaps that's where we begin, by being honest about the implications of Jesus' story, not only for our personal faith, but the implications of Jesus' story that challenge the powers that be, that resist the ways of the world, that speak truth to the systems and people in power, even when that truth is risky. Friends, we talk a lot about following in the footsteps of Jesus. And we're actually pretty good at that in many ways. We are good at being kind and compassionate. We are good at responding to the obvious needs of other people, at welcoming those who others keep out. These are things that Jesus did, and they're ways we are comfortable following him. These are things that we are comfortable continuing to do. But what we often choose to ignore are the ways that Jesus' life was disruptive to the systems, to the powers in charge. We often tell ourselves that Jesus is personal but not political, yet here in the very story of his birth, there is a political, a systemic response to his very presence. As Professor Barreto said, Jesus' presence in this world is both marked by human resistance and is a constant irritant to those in power. So what do we do with this? Because let's be honest, it is more comfortable to follow a Jesus who asks us to be kind, and some days that's difficult enough. It is more comfortable to follow a Jesus who invites us to bring canned food to the hungry or to make a donation for housing or medical care to support those who can't afford it themselves. But what happens when the Jesus we follow asks us not only to be kind and obedient, but also to be courageous? See, that's what happens in this story. Matthew focuses his telling of the birth on the person of Joseph. And most often we talk about Joseph as faithful and obedient. But let's not forget what a difficult choice this must have been. Let's not forget how courageous Joseph had to be to trust his dream enough to take the, his family on the run to another country, not knowing if they would be welcome there. A country, let's not forget, from which the Hebrew people escaped slavery some centuries earlier. Joseph wasn't just obedient. Joseph and Mary alongside him, they were brave. So what about us? Are we ready in this new year to welcome Jesus not just as a personal Savior in our hearts, but to welcome him as a power that pushes us to courageous action, even when it is risky. Are we ready in this new year to follow in the footsteps of Jesus who challenged the powers that be, even when the ways of resistance led to the cross? Are we ready in this new year to renew our commitment to speaking the truth, even when people don't like it? Are we ready to step beyond inconvenience and to really offer our lives for the cause of God's kingdom? And if you find it difficult to say yes, to these questions, friends, you're in good company. Please know that. The reality is that following Jesus is not easy, no matter how often we like to tell ourselves it is. 
But if we live with the whole truth of who Jesus was and what he stood for, with the whole truth of how people resisted his purpose and how the powers that be were shaking in their boots when they knew he was near, then we will discover that following Jesus isn't just about wearing the label of Christian, but is about living a life that is brave and even risky. So what will we do with this reality? How will we enter this new year differently than others? What commitments to courageous living will we make? In a New Year's post from Cameron Trimble, CEO of Convergence, she wrote, as we travel through Advent, Christmas, and the New Year, I pray we are brave. I pray we take risks. I pray we let go. I pray we make room. Friends, that is my prayer for you. I pray that you are brave enough to speak words of challenge and to act on your faith commitments. I pray you are willing to take risks in order to bring justice and compassion to this world. I pray you will find ways to let go of those beliefs that get in the way of your courage. I pray you make room for Jesus to lead you in new ways. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, I'd like us to pause and to ponder these words from Pastor Jill's sermon today. Living a life that follows Jesus requires us to take risks and to be brave. I want us to spend a little time to intentionally sit with these words, to not only hear them, but to see them, to taste them, to feel them, to really let them soak in. And then to listen to what ways God may be calling us to be brave, and courageous in this new year. There will be a few moments of music allowing us time to do this silently, and then I will offer a spoken prayer.
God of new beginnings, a week ago we celebrated the arrival of a new baby. Today we celebrate the arrival of a new year. At the threshold of new, we sit in a space where the past and the future touch, a space where many are tempted to reflect on what has been, while simultaneously wondering what will come. At this juncture, O oh God, we ask you to help us to clear out the old, to make room for the new. We ask that you infuse us with strength for this new beginning. For as Mary still rocks her newborn baby, we know that this is the beginning of a difficult journey for Jesus and his earthly family, one they will face with courage. And this is the beginning of a journey for us today, one that we are challenged to embrace with courage as well. So we pray that we may face this new year with renewed vigor. May we listen and hear our calling as your children and as followers of Jesus to not settle into lives of silent comfort, but rather to live lives that include risk and require bravery lives that are centered around bringing your compassion, your love, and your justice to the whole world. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, I wish to say that here at First Christian Church, we are grateful for the many gifts that you offer in support of our shared ministry. Financial gifts, may be shared by mailing a check to the address you can find on your screen or by visiting our website and clicking on the donate button there. I also, during this time, want to share with you a litany by Michael Doherty, which is a variation on Howard Thurman's When the Song of the Angels is Stilled. Please hear these words. The work of Christmas begins. When the carols have been stilled, when the star-topped tree is taken down, when family and friends go home, when we are back to our schedules, the work of Christmas begins. To welcome the refugee, to heal a broken planet, to feed the hungry, to build bridges of trust, not walls of fear to share our gifts, to seek justice and peace for all people, and to bring Christ's light to the world. Today, may we make commitments of how we will show God's love to others in brave and new ways. And may this be part of our offering to each other, to our community, and to the whole world. This is a day of new beginnings, time to remember and move on, time to believe what love is bringing, bring to rest the pain that's gone, for by the life and death of Jesus, God's might spirit now as then can make for us a world of difference as faith and hope are born again then let us with the spirit's daring step from the past and leave behind our disappointment This is a day of new
As we prepare for communion, this is the time, if you haven't already gathered it, when I would invite you to gather the elements that you will receive today. The story of Christianity is centered in the courage of one who continued to love, who continued to fight for justice, who continued to live from compassion. It is a story that led him to the cross because the world then, as the world now, struggles to be ready for this kind of courage. Yet today we come to this table and we claim again our commitment to living courageously, to being brave and bold in the ways of Jesus. So we come and we remember this meal he shared with friends, how he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body. And so when we eat of the bread, we offer our bodies for his continuing work in this world. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus took a cup and he passed it to them and he said, drink of this for this is a new covenant. And because we trust that this is a covenant of love, when we drink of the juice, we invite God's loving spirit to flow through us. Let us now share in this meal. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, by partaking of the bread and juice, we have affirmed our desire to follow your teachings and seek your guidance in all things. We are beginning a new year and often think of this time as an opportunity to start fresh. Many of us will make a list of new resolutions for the year. Guide us as we make that list. Help us remember that our most important resolution should be to treat others as we would like them to treat us. Help us keep this resolution throughout the year. When we struggle and fail, give us the strength and determination to keep trying. Sometimes it feels that we are wasting our time and energy. People don't notice or care about our attempts at being loving and kind. We think our actions are insignificant. Help us remember that our actions do influence others. If we are unpleasant to someone, it can alter their mood and cause them to be unpleasant to someone else. 
But if we show love and kindness, that that love and kindness may be passed on instead. Lord, give us strength to continue being loving and kind to all people, because what we do can make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the coming year, may you be brave enough to speak words of challenge and to act on your faith commitments. May you be willing to take risks in order to bring justice and compassion to this world. May you find ways to let go of those beliefs that get in the way of your courage. And may you make room for Jesus to lead you in new ways. Amen.